postdoc. And during that time of my postdoc, I was constantly uh, approached by my industry to provide consultancy. Right? And I, was, I didn't even know how to do that properly until a certain time I said, OK, I'm going to start doing that. And I ended up quitting my job. So like, look, I don't want to do this anymore. It's actually a lot more fun, but, you know, real problems, a lot of things that um, you, know, you can apply. And you can see that you're actually very valuable. So a lot of times when you're doing your PhD and you're doing your research, you don't think that what you're doing is actually valuable for industry, but it's extremely valuable. Right? And so this is one thing, like, look outwards your research. Look at how much value you're actually bringing. And a lot of people are willing to, to, to pay for that value, right? And, and after that, I'll just relate to that. It's actually, um, you can see that you're very more employable if you actually start applying this kind of value to the industry. And you can start communicating that what you do is valuable. So that, that's come to another point that you made, which is like, uh, know how your value, know your skills, know your, your skills, right? So this is very, very important. Know how much value you're bringing to your research, but also bringing it to company and bringing it to people who want to, to have that set of skills. Excellent advice. Um, so I would like to pass out to you because this is your opportunity to ask questions. So I can't see very well up in there, but um, can anyone want to ask a question? I have others I can ask if you don't, but I think it's much better coming from you. Anyone? Oh, there's one up there. See over there. Fabiola will bring the mic to you. Hello. Uh, do you think uh, PhDs, PhDs are able to adequately articulate their skill set? And if not, how can they bridge the gap? So in this research project, uh, the, the feedback was that there, that's lacking somewhat. So almost that either you're too modest in the way that you present what skills you have, or you don't actually recognise that you have those skills. Again, going back to the workshop that we had yesterday where we were looking at the transferable skills that were important to employers, often individuals didn't think that they had things like leadership skills or they had experience of maybe responding to policy or that they were particularly good at communicating. But of course you are. You know, you're having to convince people every day that what you're doing is, is important. So what the advice on bridging the gap was just get that practice of reflecting on what your, what your what your skill set is and finding examples of how to evidence that and then talk about it in a way that is really convincing um, to the employers. Yeah, um, I, I find most PhDs are, are very good at articulating their technical skills, no problem there at all. Uh, and, and there's a lot of variability in the extent to which people are able to articulate what it is about them that's, that, that we should be uh, impressed by in terms of their employability. So I think it's really important to be thinking about those soft skills, those other skills that you have, identifying areas where you think you need to develop and looking for opportunities to develop those skills. Um, Claire talked, one of the points that came up in the presentation was to grab opportunities, and I can't emphasise that one too much because you know, people may, you may have a view about how your career is going to run, it will almost certainly not run that way. And you may find that opportunities come up um, to do something that you may not have expected but will really develop an aspect of your value proposition to a future employer. And um, it's always worth thinking about taking another, a slightly different path. Very, very little to add there, but um, I completely agree. People normally cut themselves short. If you think your skills are not valuable and you're too modest and you keep looking at the professor or the other person that got a better paper than you did, uh, don't do that. You know, like you, you, you have uh, very good skills. Uh, and I, I tell you from my own experience, like well, I only realized that skills when I build a product um, in two months' time, and people willing to pay a million dollars for it. Not for me, right? <laughs> but we, I, I built this product practically by myself, and we sold it for a lot of money. And I was like, wow, never realized that, right? So just be conscious that you have a, a very invaluable set of skills, and don't, don't sell yourself short. Before we go to another question, I want to pick up, um, Tom used the term soft skills, and that's used really a lot for transferable skills which often means those you know, human skills. And I've said recently, I like to change the term to the hardest skills. You have hard skills and you have the hardest skills. 
and that's why <laughs> I'd like to rebadge the soft skills to that because we have no world wars, we have fabulous relationships, everything would be absolutely brilliant if we all had those harder skills down the path and we don't. So they are key when you're um, working, you know, creating, working in teams and leadership and all those, that's, they are the harder skills. So anything else? Again, spotlights here, so you really have to wave your hands. problem-solving skills is limited to a small area and it is based on a, a thorough knowledge of our, of our literature, of our field. Uh, how do you transfer that to a much broader area that is required and usually at the workplace? So the question was how do you, um, if problem-solving skills are seen as a limited Scope. There's only a limited scope when it's looking at PhD. How do you make that broader and more transferable? Problem solving skills. How, how how would you go into? Sorry. So what it is, I guess, is um, I think the question is saying that they're quite narrow when you're doing a PhD. Your, your problem solving is is related only to you know that area. How do you make it so that they're broader and show that to the employer? Correct, but at the same time, even though it's a narrow scope, you know, your PhD, you, there's a lot of constraints, right? You, you try to do your PhD and you're trying to find something new um, in this very specific area. So it, it takes a lot of skills to do that and, and to, to find it. Um, I think it depends on the employer, it depends on where, um, um, where you're working. For instance, in data science practices and, and where I work, uh, that's very valuable because you're actually going to work uh, with very specific problems. On a, on a restricted domain with, uh, with you know, very, a lot of constraints, a lot of things, and you have to think very deeply about problems. So it's actually, it depends where you're gonna work, obviously, but there's, there, there, there's actually work for people that can think uh, very deeply about something, and creatively, I thought, I thought the other part that creativity is, is enormous, like, you, you're doing a PhD, you are being creative, you're trying to find solutions for something that is very hard, and, um, that's valuable. I, I think you. I'm not, I'm not sure I answered the question, but I'm, I'm just saying that you, you, even, even though you're thinking that you're very narrow, you're probably not. Mm -hmm. that too? I agree. Yeah. I mean, one of the things you, you will probably find as you go into the workplace is the problems themselves become broader. So there's a necessity to think more creatively and expansively. But the good news is you won't be alone in most cases. You'll be part of a team, and you'll be you'll hopefully be on a team where there's diversity of thought and diversity of experience. So you know, that's how you learn to think differently about problems is by looking at how other people approach problems. Um, and that's one of the great pleasures of, of you know, a career where you, you, you realise how much more you, you know than you used to know as you go forward. Anything to add, Claire? No, I, I was just sort of reflecting on the question and just thinking it it's, I would say that it's the most transferable skill potentially that you have um, because you and again that's maybe because you're just underselling and not recognising just how good you are at problem solving I mean that's going to be key employers are just going to love the ability and you'll probably be the go-to person for any problem that happens in the organisation because you're just you know you've, you've got that ability to, to solve the problems and to be confident um, in putting your ideas forward um, often people think they don't have something to offer because they, they come from a narrow technical background, but uh, the more confident you are about speaking up, I think you'll find that um, people appreciate your thinking, your thoughts. I think a key bit word there too is collaboration and, and in Claire's research and I think a couple of others you said that was that um, it's about asking other people, you know, like it, you, this isn't your only, it's your research project anymore, it's work and you can actually talk to a whole bunch of people, so, you know, that's good. So where was the next question? Yeah. Oh, it's me, hi. Um, I noticed that Claire said you, in your research, you found that employers found no difference really between people with masters or PhDs. So I was wondering if you guys, in your practical experience, have found there is a difference or something that PhD 
people are contributing over and above people with master's degrees. I don't have a great data set on that, because <laughs> we mostly employ PhDs. Um, we actually, my office stopped funding masters a few years ago because we just weren't getting the candidates. Um, there wasn't the demand to do the masters. If you were serious about a career in research, people were heading for the, the PhD option. Um, again, I think it's the individual and what, what your career aspiration is, what you can, you might choose. I have a masters, I don't have a PhD. I don't think it's helping that. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't exactly know how to answer that question, but um, we have a lot of PhDs, and um, there's a few people that are signed up in our data science practice that um, are just graduates. And what they did, they actually went for the master to complement their skills. Um, but they, it's very, very specific. Like they're doing a master's because they want to do the data science. They actually want to work in the industry. They want to uh, get better at the theory that they, don't, they didn't have. Um, when the PhD, you have a lot of theory, um, and then when you come to work, you actually adapt yourself to, to, to not so much the theory. Theory is easy because you have that background. You actually adapt into the workplace. So. The people that we have that have masters, actually, they did the other way around. They were actually working and then developed the skills for the master. Um, so I'm not quite sure. It seems different. It's like different career paths. But I think yeah, um, having a PhD is valuable. It's valuable. It's just a different career path. Yes, yeah, so I did hear um, some an academic once say, if you're going to do a PhD, do it because there's nothing else you'd rather do. So I think it's that thing of just knowing that by doing a PhD, there's so many options. So it's not the reason you're doing a PhD to get the job, but you know you have options should you, you know, be desperately seeking one, which seems to be the case. Can I, can I just add on that, that specific point? I did my PhD not because I wanted to work for industry. That's why I did my postdoc and everything. And then I did a U-turn and went back to industry. It, it, I, I agree with that statement. It's not, I didn't do a PhD because of industry. But there is that option, and it's being increasingly more valuable, uh, especially now that you, you know data science is one of the areas that's booming, um, and a PhD is extremely valuable there. Not only, in, but specifically computer science or anything, but any area that people are working with lots of data and applying uh, scientific methodology, uh, that seems valuable in the industry because now you can actually make decisions based on data, make decisions based on, on something else than previously was just gut feeling, right? And most of the time, good feeling was wrong. And now we can actually validate that, we can actually quantify this, this information. So it's being increasingly Anyone else out there? I can see better now. One right up the back. Go, Fabi. Oh, no, we've got one here. I was just wondering if there's like a standard set of transferable skills that you would recommend that all PhD students try and highlight in their CVs and interviews. Very good question. So in the UK, we do have that standard set, and I mentioned it briefly. Um, it's called the Researcher Development Framework. It was developed by an organisation called GTI, who, if you, I, I think the quarter you're kind of currently looking at potentially being a member, more and more Australian universities are signing up, but they're basically are an intermediary between the government and universities in the UK. And they consulted with employers, universities, researchers, uh, other stakeholders on what are the skills that you should be looking for if you're going to be a successful researcher. It is quite focused on the academic career, but by their very nature, and the reason we're talking about this is they're all transferable. So research and technical skills are in this framework. There are 63 different competencies uh, that you are meant to have. So, but it goes into detail and actually takes you along the timeline trajectory from PhD right the way through if you wanted to actually go on to a professorial level. So it's a really fantastic resource. Give it a Google, RDF, VTI, um, and there are lots of different tools that you can access to assess your skill set based on that competency framework. I've not found a more robust framework, to be honest. I haven't either, I have to say, again, I bet Julie. Um, we all sort of look at that, and it's been around since 2009. Uh, so, you know, there's been a lot of work done on that. We're yet to get there in Australian universities. We're, we're in our early days. Uh, so, we had a question right up the back, I think. Yes. Um, do you have any comments on um, people with PhD and doctoral degrees and masters, for that matter, um, being overqualified in the workplace during employment, um, interviews, and all that sort of 
okay, the question was, do you have any experience of people who have PhDs or masters that are seen as being overqualified in the workplace? I don't think there's any such thing as overqualified for anything. Um, uh, if an employer was to say that, then you're probably applying for the wrong job. Um, but, but to me, it's um, you know, it's a matter of valuing what the person brings. And, and you know, when I interview people for jobs. I'm far more interested in who they are as people and how they're going to work in the environment that they're coming into than, well, I'm still very interested in their skills and knowledge and experience, but to me, those other skills are really critical. Um, so I, I, I tend not to agree that it's, it's possible to be overqualified, um, unless you took it to an extreme, and, you know spent 45 years of your life studying and then decided you wanted to walk into a job in, you know, in coals. <laughs> and then it'd be a matter of how you write your job application and Julie and I could help with that. Um, Lewis? Oh, I completely agree again. Uh, if, you, if you think you're overqualified, you're applying for the wrong job. If you do, if you, sorry, just Sally, if you do feel like you're overqualified for the job, we had a discussion about this yesterday again, what is to actually address that in, in applying for the job. So in your cover letter, then just explicitly say, you know, you may not think that, that if I'm, you know, I'm overqualified, you may think that my academic qualifications are such that I would be looking for an academic here, but I want to make this transition out to your organisation and work in this sector, and just be explicit about your career aspirations and, and why you, you know, so that you can alleviate any concerns you feel that the employer might have that you are overqualified with the PhD. But I, I would say, coming from HR and careers, just leave out all the I do not have, although you may think that, just put all the positive stuff saying, I'm really interested in this career, I'm looking for a transition, this is very exciting, you know, avoid the I do not have, you may think this, because I must say if you wrote that, I'd just put you in the, no. Pile. So I want to hear what you can do, not what you can't do. Anyone else? Any questions? We've got three minutes. Hi. Um, so PhDs are not from a homogeneous group. They come from these varied backgrounds. They are research fields which are more closely related to industry, like computer sciences, but they're also fields that are sort of more remote to the industry. Have you had any experience employing someone from a background that's not that directly connected to industry? Like you mentioned, there's a philosopher in the bank in the statistics area. What does he or she do? And do you have any experience employing someone like that? Well, uh yeah, maybe it would be a bit misleading what I said, but he was a philosopher who did a PhD in neural networks again. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I agree that the group that I, I mean is very technical, um, uh, maths, uh, physicists, um, uh, uh, computer science. But uh, just to give an example, one of the physicists that we have working for us, um, he, he used to work at CERN. So he you know, was doing uh, theoretical physics, um, and completely changed to work with retail banking uh, at later time. So it's quite a, quite a big jump there. So um, I think the, the main thing is that he has that transferable skills, which means working with high, lots of data, like that's what they do, physicists, computing all the, the atom physics, bumping into each other, and so uh, Simulation, everything, those skills are transferable to any organization. Um, whether, you know, um, if you come from another area which is less technical, then I wouldn't be able to answer that. But, but I see in, in a bank, um, in general, there's a lot of PhDs in high level management, uh, which didn't come from, from technical areas. So I don't exactly know the career paths, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's valuable as well. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> one question I'd always ask, you know, why are you interested in this job? have a qualification in X for this job is Y. And sometimes the answer to that can be very, very illuminating. Um, again, in our organisation, we have people from all sorts of backgrounds. And, you know, particularly in the, there's, there's a whole lot of us who aren't working as scientists, where, where the kind of support people for the organisation and 
very diverse background, so I'm sure there's a few philosophers in there somewhere. Uh, so yeah, and as you, you as you kind of progress in your career, you find that you are less, well I find I'm less and less connected to my qualifications from way back when, that I'm actually doing stuff that's completely unrelated. And uh, at some point it's the core skills of leadership and, uh, you know, organisational management that become more important as you become more senior. So you have to switch your focus a bit to developing those skills. I would completely echo what Tom just said there. In my own team, we have a biomedical engineer and a chemist who both did their PhDs, did a couple of postdocs. And I asked that exact question, why this job when it's so far removed from your discipline area? And what they said was they really valued the training and development that they had experienced through their PhD and the alternative side to just the pure research. So they had a real passion and interest in actually getting involved in supporting PhDs using the experiences that they'd had. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, we've run out of time for our little session, but I will say there's um, a couple of other people over here that don't have science and are working in other areas, and they might address that question in your session. So thank you. This, you know, you'll remain sitting there, and there's um, the networking to come where you can ask more questions. Uh, but certainly, um, I just want to say thank you very much to the three of you, and uh, we'll move on. So, thank you.